Good morning, church. A very warm welcome to all of us to this morning's service. Our service today is led by Reverend Martin Bukis. Uh, without much I do, I would like to hand over to Reverend Martin to lead us in service. Thank you, Fred. Good morning, church. Good morning, Martin. Shall we pray together? Gracious and loving God, we gather together uh, in this place to worship you. And so as we come, we pray that you would help us to sing your praises with open hearts. To pray in faith for that which we need and for the state of our world. And to hear the word of scripture read and expounded and to learn something of your love. For, Lord, we come into this place expecting to find you here. And so we pray that you would be with us. Amen. Jesus, faithful friend and true. We come in worship, but we come knowing that we are people who are not as true as we wish to be. We have done things we are not proud of, and we have not done the things that you have called us to. In the quiet, Lord, we offer to you the many small ways in which we fail to hit the mark in which we fail to bring glory to God. Lord, we know that you are just and you are good and that you are forgiving. And on that we depend. We say together the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. People throughout his life came to Jesus in search of healing and of mercy. And to all of them, Jesus said, your sin is forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in, one, in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given the Spirit's 
the message of wisdom to another the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one as he determines. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. But it is with, but it is with Christ, for we all were baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body every one of them just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it says, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, each part suffers with it. If one part is honored, Every part rejoices with it. Amen. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and by him and for him. He is therefore, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to him, himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen.
This week, we're going to think a little bit about a line which comes up three or four times right near the end. Um, Paul likes to do these slightly ridiculous illustrations every now and again. And so he speaks about hands telling feet that they don't need them. Uh, Good luck trimming your toenails without hands. Yes, so your feet still need them. But the image that always comes to mind for me is the image of an angry little child. Um, I don't know if you've had this experience. It may have been you, it may have been uh, children you were helping, but someone who was trying to tie their laces. And they tell you, I don't need you to help, and they tie their laces. And the immediate thought that runs through my head when a five-year-old tells me they don't need my help is, oh, good luck getting lunch then. Or who's going to drive you to school or your friend's house? Who's going to run your bath or tuck you into bed? Um, We might not need help in one very specific area of our lives when we're a child, and we want to gain that independence, but we still need help in other areas. It's a good illustration of what church life should look like. Because uh, as we have our own gifts and our own experiences, we might be very good in one area of the life of the church, but we don't have the foggiest idea what we're doing in another. Unfortunately, too often uh, we find that we uh, are stuck in an area doing something in the life of the church where we're not particularly gifted for it, where there's someone else in the room who is, but we find ourselves doing it because no one else offers. The passage from Colossians, well, well, it's an ancient hymn that Paul's taken and he's amended a little bit, but it's this ancient hymn about how Jesus is in all and all is in him. Jesus has created everything. Uh, and, real, uh, and Jesus comes before all of us. It speaks also about how Jesus is the head of the body, the head of the church. How Jesus is where the church finds all of its direction and inspiration. To steal the words from the first week, Jesus is Lord. But I thought it's really important to start there. Because as we think about how we use our gifts today, the thing we need to remember is that we only use our gifts as Jesus directs us to use them. If Jesus is the head of the body and we are the body, you would hope that the body does what the head wants it to. When our bodies start doing things that our head doesn't want them to, generally we go to a doctor because something's wrong with our body at that point. And sometimes that's just about uh, us losing ability, but sometimes that is about something being wrong, something being sick within the body. That hymn from Colossians also draws a picture for us about how we as the body are not defined by our sin, by our failings. Rather, we're defined by our purpose. We are Christ's body, so we're the moving, doing, acting bits of Jesus on earth. We have a purpose as the church, the purpose to continue the faith that Jesus has left us. So we're going to look at a few verses from the bottom end of our reading from Colossians. Uh, Sorry, not Colossians, from Corinthians, where Paul sort of gets to the point of what was going wrong in the church in Corinth. Because 
He's gone to quite some extent to explain to us what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. He even lists some possibilities. The list isn't exhaustive, though. Uh, And then he goes to speaking about us being a body. Us, the hand saying to the foot, I don't need you. And so these are some of the things he tells us that I think are important. On the contrary, this is after the I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. So, as a good Methodist minister, I should not use a violent example, but I'm going to. Because this will get the point across. Our internal organs are not very strong, yes? They are well protected. If you were to walk up here and I were to punch you in the kidney, how good would you feel about it? Not, not very, right? It's not designed to, to take a knock at all. And yet, if we never had kidneys, life would get very, very difficult very quickly. Only for about, how, how long has dialysis existed? 40, 50 years? Probably not more than 50 years. 50 years ago, if your kidneys weren't so good, that was it. You were coming to the end of your life. Now we can extend it slightly. But those gifts within the body of Christ, which are a little bit hidden, that we don't see every day, are actually the ones that are almost the most important. We'll come back to that. There should be no division amongst the body. So that, this, so that its parts should have equal concern for each other. But the problem with using our gifts in the life of the church is too often uh, we will see someone doing something and think, I could do that. I think, I think God's given me the gifts to do that. And we try, and someone says something disparaging. And then we never try again, even though we were right in the first place that that is the gift that we have. But we've never used it again because one person said something uh, to discourage us from doing it. But on the other hand, we, we might be good at something, but we're not always great at identifying what we're good at. And so we never use that gift because no one's ever come to us and said, Nick, you are really good at dealing with small children, unlike me. So every part should have equal concern for the other. We should uh, be encouraging each other to use our gifts. And we should probably be telling off the people who, who make someone feel bad for trying. Um, there's a church in the States uh, run by, a, well, used to be, was founded by a crazy pastor named Nadia Bowles Weber. She's wonderful. Um, and she described her church as anti excellence and pro participation. And if that's not what this passage is saying, I don't know what it is. Because it's about us getting stuck in, even if we're not very good at it to start. No one is good at something the first time they do it. And then Paul goes on, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. I think it's fair to say that the body of Christ is not as strong as it could be, is not doing what it could do, is not glorifying God in the way we can glorify God, unless all of us are using our gifts the way God intended us to use our gifts. If one gift is put down, the whole body suffers as a result. And so I'm going to tell you a story to sort of bring this all together. Um, I used to, I've spoken about these retreats before, but I used to be involved in retreats as a teenager and into my early 20s, um, where people would go away for a weekend to encounter God and to discover God's love. And the way the weekend was set up with all the things that needed to be done, it was set up the way the church should work. I say should because I'm not sure we always get this right. 
There's all sorts of different jobs in the weekend. The first job are the ministers and lay leaders. Now, the ministers and lay leaders' jobs are to keep the conversation about God throughout the weekend, to not let it get too distracted and going to different places, but also to see to all the practical things, to make sure everything is happening over the course of the weekend. There is the minister in charge, and there's a lay person in charge called the lay director, but then there's also trainees for both of those positions on the weekend. Because if we're not teaching other people to do our jobs, I'm not sure we are honoring God. If we're not using our gifts and teaching others to use that gift within them, I'm not sure that we're honoring God. Uh, the person I always think of when I think of those roles was a man named Tony Pickles. Tony always dressed in boring black, uh, I think it was black jeans and a black t-shirt. You never see Tony in anything else. But Tony always had this amazing over-the-top bright waistcoat on. Tony was uh, in Army Special Forces a very long time ago, and uh, so he was a pretty intimidating sort of guy. He had all the scars you would expect uh, on a person that had lived a life of fighting. And yet, on any of the weekends I worked, when Tony, where Tony was around, Tony was the people, ev person everyone went to if they didn't know what was happening. Because they knew that despite Tony's life experience, he was there for one purpose. That was to help lead the people to use their gifts. And Tony was always gracious to them. Another group of people on the weekend are the prayer, the, the people who gather together to pray. Whether they were praying uh, at the weekend or with speakers or at home, there were people praying all the time. Because some of us uh, just have this burning desire within us to pray uh, for ourselves and each other and God's world. And what's the point in us coming together as church, whether it's on a retreat or us together as church, if no one's praying for what we're doing? Amazing lady named Lynn. And Lynn uh, was the most uh, gentle sort of person you would ever meet. Her children were the complete opposite of her. They were complete nutters and a lot of fun. But Lynn was incredibly gentle. And uh, if you were struggling, Lynn is the sort of person who you didn't even have to say to her you were struggling. You would walk past her and she would just grab your hand and say, I want you to come to the prayer chapel with me. Because Lynn had that sort of a connection with God because she used her gift of praying for people all the time. Speakers, people whose gift it was not to give amazing sermons, but to stand up and to tell their story of their journey with Jesus. Uh, the person who always comes to mind for me for this, his name is Cameron. He happens to be one of my best friends. What Cameron was amazing at was standing up and reading a piece of scripture and telling you a story. And you, you like hung on that story because you just wanted to know what was coming next. And sometimes all people need from us is us to share our stories of our journey with Jesus. Because that's what they need to hear in their lives. Uh, then there were companions, people who walked on your journey with you. So people who were always with you. They shared your dormitory. Uh, they had conversations with you uh, along the way. And the person I always think of when I think of the companions is a man named Roderick. Roderick had a really difficult laugh. Uh, he'd ended up homeless at one time, but Roderick was a big man. He was at least six foot five and probably four feet across, four feet across his shoulders and more than four feet across his belly. But Roderick was, he, he just had this ability to listen to you so that you knew that you were understood. Sometimes like you'd been understood for the first time in your life. 
And there are people in this room who are like that. And then there were the fairies. Um, uh, We called them the fairies. Uh, They were the helpers. The helpers were the people who you never saw. They were the people who made sure you got dinner. And they were the people who made your beds. They were people who cleaned up your table when you went out the room and you came back and your table was perfectly sorted out. And you're like, I'm sure I left stuff everywhere. And there were sweet wrappers. Uh, The people who come to mind when I think of this were Shirley and Richard. Shirley was Tony's sister. She was a tiny little lady, but she had the most energy you've ever seen in anyone deep into their 60s. And the energy didn't come from her being a naturally energetic person. It came from the joy she got out of helping the Church of Christ do what it needed to do. Preferably in the ways where Shirley never got seen. The church looks like that. There are all sorts of different gifts. There are all sorts of different experiences we've had. And the only time the church is fully alive is when we're using the gift we've been given and when when we're encouraging that gift in each other. Father God, you give us the Holy Spirit to encourage us in our journey with Jesus, to bring us to discover Christ at work in our lives, and to come to the point where we can say that Jesus is Lord. Lord, you give us the Holy Spirit to give us the gifts to build our lives, but also to build your church. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to encourage the gifts we see in each other. And we pray that you would give us the courage we need to begin to use our gifts in the life of the church so that all that we have been given, we might give back to you. So the church wouldn't suffer because we are too scared to use the gift we're given or too discouraged by our past experiences, but that we would find the joy that comes from living out all of who we are so that we would bring our own flavor to the fruit salad that is the church. Amen.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace in the power of the risen Jesus to live and work to his praise and glory. Amen.